the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time of conversation together. Help us to know you better through this time. Help us to love you more truly and fully. Especially bless all the our veterans and those who died in service for our country. We entrust um, ourselves in this conversation to the hands of our mother as we say. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst men, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So we're going to talk about the judges today. And the judges is a title given to a group of people uh, that occurred after Joshua. Uh, Joshua was the conquering of the promised land. But they didn't end up finishing. And in fact, it was never finished. And he all dropped out their history. You'll see there are other nations that coexist with them. Um, some are kind of allies, some are kind of half Jewish, and some say hey. And this is due uh, part to human sin, uh, part to weakness, and part to just people not caring. Um, so the period of the judges is about 300 years from Joshua and Moses up until the time of Samuel, uh, who is entered the period of the kings. So 300 years after Joshua, this period of judges, judges the title given to a group of 15 men uh, who appear and are raised up by our Lord at different times. And they, they are raised up by our Lord in response to idolatry. And then the people of God, they get broken by their enemies and captured and conquered and, and abused, and then they Appeal to God, and God to find the right judge, and then for 20, 30 years they're, they're faithful, and they fall away again. The next enemy comes in, and then if we pray to God, Lord save us, and Lord saves them, this is a cycle. And one of the books of the judges, one of the chapters, I actually looked up a bit more but it just has this phrase where it says, if you went back and forth, one generation would be faithful, one generation would fall away. So over and over again, 300 years, this happens. And more things change, more things. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, we're going to focus on two of the bigger figures, Gideon and Samson. Gideon's um, first and later. But there were, there's 13 other judges to read about them. Uh, why are there judges here? One of the unique figure, uh, features of the original king of Israel was there were no kings. And in fact, as a kingdom, you can almost describe it as a confederation. There were loose, there were 12 tribes. You say there's 12 tribes. There was not, there was one person ahead of them, and you had a ruler, and they were all kind of put through the other one. They thought of themselves almost as 12 separate nations, but under one people. There were these 12 tribes. Yet, yes, each of the tribes had their own leaders and their own authorities, but, a, but there wasn't this one king. There was not a king. There was a spiritual authority. They united together under the temple, or the tabernacle. The temple wasn't built in King Solomon, but the tabernacle, the tent of meeting. They were under the high priest, spiritually, under the law, under the following of the God's commandments. But there was, but the physical structure was based simply around the law. And the tavern. Did each of the tribes have their own priest leader person, or all twelve was on the Only one. Oh, okay. um, so what happened is, remember, only one tribe. So there, there was a one of the tribes, the tribe of Levi, is the priests. Now you would have. Um, the tribes, the Levites would live in, in, in different areas. They did not have their own land. So it made Levites unique, unique, because everybody else was given a portion of Israel that would belong to them. This was, and this land that was so much tied to, to them that it couldn't be sold. If I wanted to sell it, 
Well, well, so every 50 years, we have to turn back the original line, the original value. So if I would sell it, I would have to calculate uh, the worth based upon the number of harvests. So basically, I'm selling you 50 harvests. So the value of the land would change year to year. So I'm leaving after the 50 year mark, so you get 50 harvests worth. So the year before, I don't harvest it. You can have to turn next year. Because if it belongs to that, that's the heritage, that that's, that that's what ties you to the promised land, ties you to the Lord. Um, Levite gets no plan, gets no portion. Levite's portion is God of time. And so they would live with different people, they would live in different areas. And they would pray and they would, would serve on them. They'd be supported by the other tribes. And so, so a Levite might live with the with Ishmael or with uh, Benjamin. And the Benjaminites, the Israelites, or the Issachars, the Issachars, the, 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 the uh, Ashers, uh, they would support them. Um, but to be a priest or a high priest, that was the temple. Um, so the Levites would be praying to kind of like lesser services. It could be loaded locally, but the, the more uh, the more liturgical it was, the more it had to be located in the temple. Um, at times, sacrifices were done. History is, is long pumpkin. In some parts of history, the worst sacrifice is done to even a part of the temple. Um, and so the Levites, the priests, would do it the community that was sort of spanked. But the central focus was always the tabernacle, the holy of holies. Um, and so, yes, the high priest and the priests were only from this one trumpet. And the high priest was from one family in the one tribe, the family there. Um, and so, so for instance, in my family, we were the Levites. So we were the third class. The Kohans would be another class, group of families. And one of these group of families was the, the high priest. So it, it was passed on from the father's son. But yeah, so there was no king. Because. God is king. That was the whole idea. And we see this explicitly spelled out in 1 Samuel chapter 8. So the context of this is that, um, again, there's a series of back and forth, and there's some bad judges, and there's wars and fightings because of sin. Um, and the people get saved. And they, want, and they go to Samuel, who is the high priest, and they ask for a king. So they give us a king. And Samuel goes and prays to the Lord. This is the answer that the red dog gives to Samuel. Hearken to the voice of the people of all the same. They have not rejected you. They have rejected me for being king over them. According to the deeds which they have done for me the day I brought my Egypt to keep to this day. Forsaking me, concerning other God, they are also doing me. Now in hearken their voice only, the song we warn them and told the ways of the king of the world. And so it's the result of sin. First of all, the sin of, of the, uh, some of the judges leads to the, the fall of the king. And God once again uses their sin uh, to establish the kingship, and then from that kingship comes the Messiah, Jesus Christ. But God is king. And so, when the, for, for the first time here is this is this is the system. Where there and this generation are linked together by past history, uh, by they're all, they're all third, fourth, and eighth, and tenth cousins. Um, but the tie is God's king. Much like the stroke, right? We're linked together. Not, but not because of nationality or by kinship, it's going to be nationality. But more importantly, the link is the fact that God is king. <laughs> but remember the church, remember the church in Poland and South America and China and where else, linked together to God being king. Doing it this way, having the judges, having the system in place, shows first of all the privacy of God, the importance of the law. The importance of the covenant. But because the structure is based upon a man who took power, your system of, of life 
Is it centered around a human being who conquered a nation? Or a brother who overthrew his father? You know, or whatever. It's based upon uh, revealing himself, took us out of Egypt, and saved us. That's what is our is the identity of the Jewish people. So God is first. This structure, this life, this existence, echoes and keeps the spirit of authority of us alive. The judges and the servants inherit that spiritual authority. One of the things that Moses does during the sojourn of the desert is he, he sets up a system of judges, where he sets up a system where there are these level of judges based upon the importance of the case, where some silly little things are by a lower judge, then you have a higher judge, the highest judge, the back of Moses. Like how the three four system we have today. But this is a inherent structure. Well, the judges come and they uh, have the spiritual authority. They're raised up by God, called by God, from all different tribes, all different national, all different uh, parts of the nation. To serve God, to speak for God, and to bring back the people from where they're strength. To help them repent and come back to our Lord. And so having this system in place rather than a king is a perpetual reminder to come, or should be. Why are they called judges? The judges are called that way because of the fact of what their, their focus is. A judge has to do with what? Right and wrong. The law. Yeah. So they're judging, first of all, the pagan nations. They're often out of, they're used to them out of war. Usually they're fighting. Right? Where the pagans are coming in, trying to defeat the Israelites, they're coming in with them. Um, these these the devout sitting there and saying, I've got some friends, and you're fighting for this. And so these are the ones who are going to stand up and fight and defend God and their and their other nations. And the ones who are going to stand up and lead the nations against pagans. They're the ones who are going to cast down the idol worship, the idolaters, turn down the altars to the by themselves. But by their brothers. And they also then govern and judge Israel. And what they're telling Israel is you have sinned. That's why you're suffering. If you are faithful to God, God will be with you. If you bow down to false gods, God will withdraw the control of you. You come to God, so help me, God will help you. And so they're judging the righteousness of Israel, and they're judging the wickedness of pagan nations. So they're standing there to defend, to teach, reform, to heal. And this goes on for three years. Questions on this? What's the Hebrew term for judge here? It actually is related to uh, uh, Adonai. So Adonai means judge. Uh, it's not the same term, but, but Adonai is related to the word for judge. I don't remember the exact Hebrew term used for this particular case, or but I know that Adonai is related to judge. Because uh, in the scriptures, only God would judge hearts. And so whenever it refers to Jesus Christ seeing hearts, going in the hearts of them, as a tie back to the title of Adonai, Lord. Uh, which literally is judge. The one who sees the heart, knows the heart, and that. Uh, and so they're not, I don't believe it's Adonai, but it's going to be related to word. Let's then look at Gideon and his story. Now, I, I should have looked up which of the 15, which would never be found in the place. I didn't look up before, which I should have. Uh, so these were uh, consecutive? They weren't like 15, like the Supreme Court, all the ones? No. So, so these were, you had one person, and maybe a period of peace for 30 years. And then someone else, then we're more out of worship to crop up, then there would be an attack and defeat by the pagans, 
then another very raised up a piece for 50 years, and then they pull back again. So there's this, this ebb and flow of remembrance. How long would they be the judge for? Dependent, usually for their lifetime. Um, but they have all that would be dependent on the person. Um, so some of this call when they're older. So, so Gideon, for example, is a judge of Israel for a longer time than Samson. Uh, Sam Samson dies when he's still about to be on that. Um, Gideon dies in the day. So when there's, like, when you said there's peace in the land, and then it happens again, and they raise up another judge. During the peaceful time, there's no judge? No, no judge. Okay. And that was only 15 uh, over the fourth period of the year. Okay. Uh, there would be more than that. Uh, but yeah, so because, yeah, there's no need for a judge because the people are living with those The judge is there as a response to sin, to her mind, kind of lead them back, to the fire, and do the covenant. And then it was great for a while, and then all the way again. So it's, it's this constant need all that, right? It's been our own yeah. you know, to keep persevering, to keep renewing, to keep healing. Who yeah. does the Lord appoint the judge? Yes. Or the people? The Lord. The Lord appoints the So there's always a call for This is sort of a niche question. Did, you said Gideon died at old age, so did he live to see the judge that succeeded him? Or no. did he die before that? He died before that. Oh. Died before that, he died peacefully in bed, with children and everything else. But he was offered the he, I believe he was offered the kingship and he refused. Smart man. man. Yes. Yeah. I was just curious if any of the judges lived to see their successor. During his entire life, was there a law since the entire time? No, uh, after this you should go to talk about there was that peace. So he, he saw the restoration of Israel. Yeah, he saw that. Uh, but the first half of his life was in work. Yeah. Uh, but after these great defeat, great victories from true God, he was able to rest and relax. And he was famous and renowned as a champion of God, uh, both of his own people and also the pagan nations as they saw what happened. So. So the story of Gideon, the, the, the Amalekites, in this case the Midians. So Israel has fallen into idolatry. Again. Yeah. <laughs> and they're fallen into pagan gods, they're intermarrying, and, and they're fallen into other things. And because of that, Midian, uh, who is on to the, the east of Israel, rises in power. And they begin to oppress Israel. And basically, the way it's described is, is they make a series of rites. They're, they're like this, this nomadic people just like the rain of rain. So they'll wait for the harvest, is that the, the right is fucked, and then they'll come swoop down and take the harvest and go back home. You know, that's how they're going to ride the work, or ride any plants, and they'll get to Israel. And they'll do this for years. You know, they, they would take whatever they wanted to, and the Vikings did up north. It's what the, the this area had sent out raiders. <coughs> Historically, people do that. It's, it's, you would know, to fight your royal people is an easy way to get ahead. You're brain your foot. So Midian is a of people, and Gideon is a young man, and he's not very important. He's sent to Midian later. So he's in, in, in a hidden way. In, in the wine process, says, threshing. So he's doing the work. The moment he's there, the angel of God appears to him and says, Hail the champion of God, the Lord is with you. <laughs> <laughs> he says, Whoa. Lord can't be with First of all, you know, the Midians are this harm for us. Second of all, who am I? You know, my father is, is, is a not this is kind of an important man, and I'm really an important my father's house. What do you mean? Um, who, who are you talking about? <laughs> and he says, no, no, you are called by God, you are going to a victory, you're going to take care of the people. And so he believed in his work. He, he goes and he he says, well, let me give you something to eat, wait here, we'll come back. And he goes and he brings for sacrifice a meal, basically. He thinks he's a very, very proud of 
Management reveals who the killer comes from. He touches the meal with a stack that rubs the flame as offered to God. And he realizes his name is speaking to me, ball of his face, and the angel repeats, you know, God is with you, go and take care of it. He begins, therefore, then, by destroying the pagan altars. So he goes and he finds the altars to Baal, the altars to the Ashtaroth, and the other pagan gods, and tears it up. And some of the men, the men there tell him, wait a minute, who are you, who are you? Why would you dare to tear down these? This is your property. What are you doing? He says, who will contend with Baal? He's stuck. He says, I don't know. He's given the nickname, the contender of Baal. <laughs> He's called Jeremiah. The one who contends with Baal. Because he goes over there, in spite of his fighting against his life, tears down the altars, throws cuts down the sacred poles, breaks the statues. Because they're pagan, idolatrous worship done by Israel. Naturally, this is not taken well, at least by some people. <laughs> and so there is a gathering for war. As he calls to himself those who are going to fight for Israel. And 32,000 men are spawned, which is a bad number, honestly. Not a bad turnout. <laughs> but on the other side, Midian and the Amalekites, so it's Midian and their allies get together, you have 135,000. So it's those odds, you know, four to one odds, it's a little, looks a little less, less good. But it's there. Now again, at this point, it's like, but, uh, okay, do I do this? Again, he's not trained for words. He's not a trained lawyer. He's not, you know, he's a lady. Oh, my God. And he asks, therefore, he says, give me a sign, Lord, this is truly your will. To show me a sign. And God speaks to him and says, whatever you want, we will assure you, let me know. I'll give you a sign. It's okay. I'm going to put on the ground a fleece. And the next morning, I would like the fleece to be wet with dew, for the ground to be dry. Normally, you put on the ground evidence whenever it's dry. The fleece to, to, to be wet with dew, for the ground to be dry. The next morning, I'll be cold, the fleece is wet, and the ground is dry. If wait more, I'll just take a double check. <laughs> sure, it is. I'm going to leave it along the same place. Let's make sure it's not. You know, it's a good skip, right? It's, 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 it's science, you study the science, it's tested. That's good news. So I'm going to leave it alone, but the next, the next morning, make the ground wet and the, and the fleece dry. Then I'll know it's from you, not just natural stuff. The next morning, lo and behold, the ground is wet and the fleece is dry. He goes, okay. Four to one, we can do this. Let's go. Defenders <laughs> advantage. That's right. Hold on turf. For the work. God says, no, there's too many people here. If you win, for one of the things, people will assume it's, it's up to you, it's your prowess, it's your bravery, and glorify you. He says, tell everyone's afraid to go home. He goes, okay. And so he says, okay, if you're afraid, what the bad one of it, right? And it's four to one. Go home. 22,000 leave. There's now 10,000. I was at 13 to 1. It's okay. What are you doing, Lord? It's okay. And God says, no. Look at the man here. Is it, this is enough. People are still assume that you were just powerful and great and amazing. No. Here we go. I want you to go to everyone out in the stream. And if they whack the water up with their hands, you go on the side, if they just sit down, if they fly down and drink, put it on the other side. So those who lie down and drink, they send home. And there's commentaries on how many of what this would mean, and the prevailing theory that I've seen is that if you are kneeling down using your hand, 
you're keeping on the alert and you're not in the leisure. You're lying down, you're intemperate, you're just consumed by the thought of the water, and so the or maybe it's not referring to that. <laughs> so we're still at 10,000. <laughs> this is the real 300. <laughs> These are the books of the people. How do we men to destroy the army of the sun? And God says, here's what I'd like to do. I want you to go, wait till the, the, the dark is moon, there's no moon. Take with you a jar and a lamp, a, a, a torch. And surround the camp. Right, so now you're spread thick. <laughs> right, so these are the men who were afraid, these are the men who were terrified. Surround the camp. And then Gideon, when the time is right, blow your horn. And cry out a sword for the Lord and for Gideon, smash the jars, light the lamp, light the torches. They have the weapons. <laughs> this is the Isle of the Carrier. So they go out, surround the camp. And at midnight, they blow the horn, smash them, the pots all together, bring out the torch, the light the torches, and cry out a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. And the people get up, the swords get up, and because of two different people, they're allies, but not so many. In the dark, they've been fighting each other. In the dark, they've been killing each other. No one dies of Gideon's army. The battle is so fierce because now that you have people now who allies who aren't in the same nation, now that they're hating each other and getting revenge on each other, so they're, 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 they wake up now fighting each other. Only 15,000 survive. No one dies from Gideon. So this entirely destroys and defeats the Midians. Midianite, the, the line of Midian is only where a threat of the entire lifetime of Gideon. 15,000. So 120,000 perish from fighting each other. Not a single person dies on the other side. And then, then, then because of that, land is faithful to Gideon first land, and he dies in peace. Now he does so some seeds of uh, difficulty later on, because he does, he has many concubines, he has many sons, so that then there is, is this fighting after his death, who should lead them, who should be in charge, and please worry about it later on in the road. But, on these alive, we can but the story then, the point of this is first of all, this need for repentance and turn back to God. There is this great need then for people to return to the Lord. And it's something they can't do by themselves. A Gideon who would call to end his, his days fresh and wheat and pain. He would not have been the one to leave. Because he's called, the angel appears to him. He goes and defeats the entire nation, basically by himself and handful of people there. And it's a very clear showing where salvation comes from. But because it was done this way, because it happened this way, because it wasn't done this way, I don't know. What's being shown? Salvation comes from God. Healing comes from God, not from us. By ourselves, we can't overcome these things. And when we ourselves are trapped in sin, and trapped in idolatry, trapped in barriers that keep us from God, we can't wage war by ourselves. And we are expected to wage war. Gideon's not told to sit back and he eat he, 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 bonbons and take a nap. He's told to go over the war. But the war is the Lord's. The fight is the Lord's. The victory is the Lord's. The Gideon has to be willing to go out and be the champion, go out and stand fast, go out and call people, go out and face the ridicule, go out and face the people. You have to imagine at midnight he blew the horn and he's thinking, okay, I'm calling the attention to These people are looking for my head. They're going to war because of me. 
I'm going to war. I don't have, I have a weapon. Now, they see an army, you know, what, 13,000 times bigger than mine? Did the Midians know the name of Gideon? Or? Yeah, they must war because of the fact. They basically, from their standpoint, you think of this kind of like a, a rebel leader standing up and defending himself in the future. So they're probably going to question the rebellion, and they want to keep people all the way they were. And they want to make an example. Right, especially because he's, he's enough, to, virtually, he does call 32,000 people. You know, this is the size of a rebellion. You know, if they would crush him, if they make an example of him, they're going to spread. And so they very much want to get rid of this. They very much are going for him. And so to stand up there, you know, with a, with a torch and a jar, saying, here I am, and we're coming out of you right now, like, that takes trust. <laughs> you know, you have to be thinking to yourself, you know, Oh, heard that beta right. Maybe I should ask the third time, up, please. <laughs> wait, wait, Lord, another sign. And so, and so it is, is this great need for trust? There is this great giving of oneself to God. And that's why you have here this great victory. So it is a judge, a sign then of this trust of God, this one that God is saying to the people, God is the victory. Gideon is the champion of God because God is the champion. Now, the church fathers are very far loose in the story to explain a few things to us. They say the story is full of the types of our Lord. Let's actually stop there before we go into that. Any questions on Gideon's life on the story? I have a question. Please. When did it change when Jesus came? I mean, they talk about adultery and all this stuff, mm -hmm. but all of these ancient Jews had all these concubines and all these wives and all this stuff. So when did it become... When did idol worship change? Right, because all the ancient Jews had worshipped idols. And so so that's, that's why they didn't have one husband and one wife, because they were worshipping idols. They were just this, the baby. Yes, it was misbehaving. Okay, so the Lord never embraced no, no. these. Um, at even at like times it was tolerated. tolerated. At times it was tolerated, at times it wasn't fought against, because there was other things to worry about first. Okay. Um, but when the bigger deals, like the only one God, was dealt with, dealt with, and the focus became marriage. Yeah. Uh, but until that was done, um, it was always seen as one man or one. And the it was tolerated, especially if you were a king, but it was never bought or praised or forever allowed. There's never a time the Lord says, "Go and marry someone else." There's never a time the Lord says, "Oh, you can have a girl." It's almost always said, "One man." Or a concubine. Or a concubine. Yeah. <laughs> and whatever happens, I mean, like yeah. even Abraham, right? Yeah. And whatever happens, you read the story. This is recording history. Whatever happens, there's always. The vision is always war, it's always great pain. Okay. Right? Abraham and Sarah, it's just his prayer. Mm -hmm. With Gideon, it's, um, you have to get the more knowledge. Uh, with King David, at least the living kingdom. Mm -hmm. um, where, if you've been faithful in one line, you took the no initial in that. Okay. Uh, so it's tolerated, but it's never heard. And I think this touches on something in our culture, people who aren't familiar or who don't care, who like to poke at it, they see the Bible as this happy-go-lucky book with lots of friendly, good stories, all rated G, and in reality it's more of this history of people yeah. and how we relate to God, and so there is this ugliness, this messiness that's in it that we have to address through history and also in our own lives. And I think that's the way Well, the it reason I asked is because it was not just people that were doing sinning, it was actually people that God chose to become leaders and they were still doing that. So, yeah, well, look at King David, right? King yeah. David is described as a man for God's heart, the just man. Yeah. He's also an adulterer, he's a murderer, yeah. he's unfaithful to God. Yeah. Um, you know, he's not 
just because of those things. But it's that he repented of those things, and he was just, in spite of those things, they came back to God. I think the word tolerate. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, 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 this goes back to, like, imagine someone came to you and you were having to help them out. And they were on drugs, and they were an axe murderer, and they were adulterers. Maybe the, the folks that, maybe the folks on one thing at a time. Like axe murderers. <laughs> yeah. you know, maybe you start there. <laughs> And then work on the drugs, the candle, the coal, and then work on America. You want to for all of them at the same time. But it wouldn't be because that other stuff doesn't matter. It would be because. Triage. Is, yeah. 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 Right? And so you have a nation of the people that just doesn't get there's only one done. You know, and honestly, there is a struggle and a fight until the battle is kept in. And up until then, there is a constant fight. Back and forth, and back and forth, worshiping false gods, sacrificing their children to idols, and uh, even King Solomon, mm -hmm. who built the temple, is sacrificing to idols. Now, in his case, it's political stuff, and they probably believe in that. But he's leading other people to, to sacrifice to the idols. Uh, you, and so it was a consistent fight, much of Israel history. Only about 500 years before Christ come, they finally get the world of God. And at that point, they've lost the time. They've lost, you know, they're, they're, they've lost their status. Um, they're under subjugation much of that time. The first from the Greeks and the Romans, then they know. And that's when Christ begins to find other stuff. You've heard it say, is it, it said to you before, I say to you now. He's building all right. that. He's perfecting his complete. So it's not so it's not that we used to be okay about it. It's not. They were ready for it. They were ready for it. It wasn't time. But let's 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 get to know the going God first. And you know, and then know God's turn. And you know that, you know. But if you look at at, at the, the actual scripture what God is saying, what God wrote, uh, for you have the prophet Hosea of the Old Testament, who marries the daughters. And that lament is, is God's private. He says, in your person, in your faithful wife, is, is living out my marriage. You have the song of songs, so one man and woman. This, this is the new love song. God is real, husband and wife. You know, the song of songs isn't about you know, your concubine, you know, <laughs> and then the twelve the rising man. It's, it's one man and woman. Right? That's the love song. That's the idea. You have the book of Malachi. Now, this is after the one of God, and it's explicit. Where in Trinity for Christ, it says, Why is God angry? Because you are thinking of your wife and your youth. You're not standing with your love life. It's very, very clear that. But there has to be this progression. There was always consequences. Always consequences. Always consequences, always law, always truth, but we're hard headed. And we're slow to understand. But. And we see this again, again even with someone who was a, was a pretty good guy, it didn't work. Like what you were saying, they were saying, oh, there's people's hearts are messy. Yeah, but I just didn't understand why God would tolerate it. Because, yeah, because he was worrying about you know idol worship and sacrificing their children to. Unless it's still with the killing your children to 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 maul up first before you get really go. It seems like it's kind of tied to the New Testament stuff with Jesus about um, how he came for the sinners. And so he uses the most horrible people in history to write the story that leads to Jesus. Yes. <laughs> All of us, each one of us. It wouldn't have mattered who we picked because right. we could find something wrong with all of us. It kind of yeah. seems to be a running theme throughout the entire Bible. God rarely does everything all at once unless he really has to. <laughs> and he also rarely goes by the easy route. You understand? Yeah. He rarely goes by the one you would think would be chosen. I mean, like, you can see taking the Greeks and Romans, you know, because they were virtuous. Well, depending on the time, they were virtuous. <laughs> Um, but there are periods of time in their virtues. You know, there were periods of time the Romans didn't believe, didn't believe in, in divorce, didn't believe in marriage. Then they got jolly after that. Kind of like now. Kind of like now, yes. 
Yes. Well, we would get along very well with the Romans of Christ's time. It's one of those things where I think if I had the benefit of uh, omnipotence, I'd probably look at every single possible option, and no matter how insane it seemed, I'd pick the one with the best end result, regardless <laughs> of how much it makes absolutely no sense in the present. So. Right. And you also, yeah, you're also teaching, right? All these things are preparing for Christ, and they're teaching us that God's in charge. Right? Again, you could have had the 300,000 beats. But God says, no, I want you to feed the, the lantern and a jar. <laughs> <laughs> because that, I'm not doing it. I'm doing it. <laughs> it is fun. <laughs> it's also a beautiful thing. Or do I just put a little smear of blood on the door? Though? Right, smear of blood on the plate comes. Or just walk, you know, just get walk there, we care about it. Or a beeswax candle. <laughs> you can have a boat to cross the river instead of split the sea. <laughs> yeah. And that happens to happen today, right? How are we saved? Through washing water. Are we forgiven? By saying we dug. You know, to, to a man who would get rid of my love. Uh, how do we offer God worship? Be bread and wine. You know, these silly little things with tremendous power. I mean, I can just imagine some of the faces of the Jews in, in Egypt. Okay, we're finally going to be free. First, you're going to need a lamb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then telling them to put it on the doorposts in this way, otherwise you're going to die. <laughs> sure, Moses. <laughs> just in case. Is Samson the one that gets tied up in that building and like breaks the building down? Yes, you're too spoiled. Yeah, it's the Christ. Yes. Oh, yes. So, the first of all, let us look at the typology of Gideon. Uh, then there's a little bit of more questions first. Okay. So the church fathers are very fond of looking at Gideon as a type of Christ, as a explainer of us. And first of all, what they say is the fleece. The story of the fleece and the rock. This, they say, explains the incarnation of the virgin birth. They say, when the, when the dew comes upon the, the, the sheepskin, the fleece, and it's wet to the ground as rock, this is pointing to the incarnation that God is become man. That God comes out of the heavens and soaks into our humanity. Well, nothing else that's touched, God himself preserving the, the humanity, uh, the story of nature, preserves it and blesses it, fills it with his, with his own power, becoming one person. This dew from the heavens is a sign that God's going to come down from heavens and only touch one. And they say at the same time, when the ground's uh, wet and the dew's dry, the type of the virgin birth. There's a preserva the preservation from normal human affairs. There's a preservation from everything else. And there's a, there's a, there is a God coming and preventing normal state of affairs from occurring. And so when our Lord really conceives our Lord without the help of the man, she is one that's preserved from the, the human touch. She's the one preserved, maybe is preserved, to show that God is in charge, that God is coming to save his people. The God is coming with power and glory. And Gideon is the type of Christ. Where Gideon is the one who contends with the idols. He is the one who does so with strength. Right? His tail is a champion. Um, and so he comes, Christ is the one who defeats um, a champion, Christ is the one who defeats humility, Christ is the one who defeats him as the as light and darkness, and as a voice in the silence. Questions? Okay. Let's then turn to Samson, who, yes, is the dude who is under the pillars. <laughs> and Samson's one of those guys who. He's, a, he's considered a saint, but he had a very wild life. Not a PG story. But I guess he died well.
So, time passes. Yes, sir. So, in between Gideon and Samson, they're back in where idol worship began. This time, the Philistines. The Philistines are the Sea Peoples. They are the Mediterranean Sea on the western side, kind of the northwest of Israel. They were a powerful nation at the time. Um, and they are probably throughout the history of Israel. Um, once again, an angel appears to um, Samson's father and mother. By the way, his father's name, uh, his mother's name, um, and says, I'm going, God is going to give you a son, and you are to consecrate him to God. We're not to cut his hair, the side of his belong to God. Yeah, the man will touch it, when the God is involved with the growth of the strength of and um, he's not going to drink any liquor or, or strong drinks, which would have been a common thing. So he's dedicated to God before he's conceived the law of God. Promise to God. Samson is filled with the Holy Spirit. Goes from her. And the way that God manifests his powers to him is Samson is given a tremendous strength. But he's the original superman. Uh, he, he is um, a virgin. And the first thing is he was originally a shepherd, but many of these men are trying to be the shepherd through one of the scriptures. We've said that before. And attacked by a lion, he carries a lion a piece of his variants. He goes and visits a city or stronghold, and he is locked behind the gates at night because they're it's a city. And he into the gates, breaks through it with his bare hand, and tears him out the side, from the gates, walks off. Um, you know, right? And these were, we're not talking about a we're talking about like a, a wall of gates. So, so some that would have been you know, serious protection, probably 20, 30 feet high, probably very heavy wood. You're talking about a, not a normal human function. Um, there's a story where he is. Attacked by a man, two or three hundred Philistines, and all he has is the jawbone of the donkey. Uh, the jawbone mass. And this is his weapon, and he kills them all. Uh, without, without, without armor, without weapons, he just has his jawbone. And there is a, there is a famous poem that he wrote. It. Um, I don't remember how, how it was. It's a short poem. Um, but something, something like, um, so if someone's boasting, like Samson, I my thousand slay. Um, the response is yes, with the same weapon. The jaw of the next. <laughs> but in Samson's case, it's a real um, And there's a bunch of wars and skirmishes and by himself. And unlike it in eating, the Samson's not gathering right. Samson's a one-man show. And no one can come either. No one can come. And he comes out. He is fighting by himself. He's worried by himself. And then as the Philistines get an idea, rather than trying to fight him physically, they're going to go hire a pretty girl. <laughs> this is Delilah. And she's a fortman. That's what she's there for. She, she is hired by them, seduce him, not to see the other strike, take home. He's willing. And Sam is willing to be caught. Um, again, that's why I'm saying it was the virtue of the man, at least for one of his life, I'm not I still die. He's not a virtue, so. Okay. And Delilah um, seduces him, and you know, they're, they're together, and she says, Oh, Samson. Mm -hmm. Why don't you tell me your secret why you're so strong? Butter, butter, butter. He goes, yeah. It's because if someone gives me, I forget what he says first. He keeps telling me what kind of silly things. He tells her, you know, if somebody gives me, if someone going to tie my hands with the hair from Juan every week, is any other man. He goes to sleep, he has a drum, goes to sleep, he calls up all the other things, I got it, he's, he's conquered him, he's defeated, and he wakes up. He breaks the hair and he doesn't have them all. <laughs> and you would think at this point he would be like, hey, Delilah, you're done. He doesn't. 
And he goes back and says, oh, snap, so, so they did. That's good. Why don't you tell me? Don't you love me? Tell me what the shape is like this. And tell her something else. Like two or three times. And finally, he just tired of her. She just passed her again. He said, the worst group would lie to her. So to convince he's true, she'll get the come to come in. He kills them all. And you would think, you know, Samson would. But the thing is, Samson is trapped by the sins of lust and of pride. He stopped praying to God. He stopped putting his trust in the Lord. He's looking at himself. And then finally, he tells her, I was, I was consecrated to God from my birth. I promised I'd never get drink anything strong, or drink anything too long. Sorry, he's abandoned. He's a vow right that's what's in your And as long as I don't shave my head, as long as I don't shave my head, I will remain strong. And so she gets drunk again, shaves his head. Yeah, the Philistines again, and then Samson, enemies are upon you. He wakes up, and he has no strength in the Lord. God's abandoned. It's the abandoned God first. And so they, they grab him, they capture him, they, they cover his eyes, they take him to change and change back to the place. <laughs> <laughs> not, not looking, not, not teaching versions? No. no it's just uh, one of the lines. <laughs> Judges 16, 22. verse 22. But the hair of his head began to grow as soon as it was shaved off. <laughs> I can relate. You got strength. It doesn't stay away. <laughs> Much like some of the most famous bands of the 80s, the power is stored in the hair. <laughs> That's right. That's right. But he's, he's led in mockery. He's, he's mocked and he's publicly graded. This was a guy, you can buy into one man shop. And while he's there being mocked, he will pass. He begins to turn back the door, and his hair begins to grow as well. <laughs> and finally, um, there, there's this huge feast in honor of our God, that dad. Dagon is the. They take him to the temple of Dagon, and Samson says to the guy who's leading around, the young man who's leading around, his wife. Let me lean against the pillars, the, the main pillar there, so that you can see me, but I can be scratched against the pillar. Because he's being discreet, because he's weak, not being fed. And we lay at the main pillar. In these two main pillars. And he says, Lord, give me one last sort of strength to pop him with honor. And it's full of the crowd on the roof, looking at this man as beaded. He puts his two hands in the pillars, and pushes them over. And so it says he kills more men by his death than he did by his life. And that's how Sam, this is why he did it. They know it right away. But again, you have, again, you know, that same thing. Marriage needs to be sanctified. Marriage has to be sanctified, has to be purified, has to be perfected. It's obviously not the Lord's will. Where Samson is not being virtuous, but then he pays for it. So he ends up paying for by his death. Was he married to Dilla? No. Yeah. <laughs> she was a, a uh, woman of the night. And apparently a very cheap buyer because you are being paid by the uh, Philistines. <laughs> and how do you not know that after the fourth of the time on the night? Yeah. And so he a deal. But you like she was she was hot by that, I know. <laughs> <laughs> But Samson here then, oops, I missed a section, hold on, let's just go back up, sorry. Okay. Okay. There's a couple of important lessons from Samson, other than don't betray God. <laughs> <laughs> and don't trust strange women who keep trying to kill obviously you. kill you. <laughs> <laughs> Even if you are like, Popeye. <laughs> <laughs> if that you had to be taught a lesson though, you may deserve it. Yeah. <laughs> Samson is a great expression of the holiness of God. Not because he was so virtuous, 
yeah, there's repentance of his life, he doesn't die well. Um, but it shows the difference between those who walk with God and those who don't. I want to recommend a couple of books to you real quick. Um, so one is by a blessed, blessed uh, Columba Marmio, who was a Benedictine monk about 130 years ago. And the other is by a current author, Dr. Scott Hahn. Marmion wrote a book called Christ, the Life of the Soul. And Dr. Hahn's book is written, it's called Holy is His Name. And so both of these are books on holiness. Um, Lesson Columbia's book was, has been recommended by four or five books. Uh, both good books, both great books. Um, I like the Columbia's better, but this is what I read. But both are good. Now, the thing is, one thing that Scott Hahn says that, uh, that was, I found very fascinating and kind of surprising about it, was he says in many places, talk about holiness, never define it. Never define it. Never say what it is. Um, he says, he, looking at a Bible dictionary when he was at the, the St. and it says the definition of holiness is it, uh, uh, makes you holy. You know, it never explains it. It's just kind of walk, beat around the bush. And he says, he, in his opinion, he could be right. He says that uh, one of the problems of the church, one of the keys to the church, is that no one ever knew holiness. They're told to be holy, they never told how to be holy or holiness. Let's talk about holiness because this is very fitting for Samson for this thing. Holiness in its essence, again, both books are, if you want to read more about this, important. I write the title of the books. If you want to look at them, I'll leave them here, take a look at them. Um, holiness, its essence, is a description of the being of God. We see, for example, the angels in Isaiah chapter 6 and later chapter 20. When um, they praise God, they say, Holy, holy, holy. You say, I'm going to the church. And this is a description of God's own being. Holiness is something that belongs to God. What is that? Well, it's God's life. It's who God is. And so first of all, it is a reference to God's otherness. Which is still pretty, a pretty vague description. <laughs> but what it's saying is, God is what we're not. God is not great. God is not sinful. God is not weak. God is not wrong. God is not stuck here. God is... Yes. So it's trying to get the fact that God is different than we are. It's not a creature, but a creator. And we can describe this. So it begins with, again, another kind of abstract term that doesn't sound very exciting. It kind of sounds too. And this is God is self existent. Not only is He not created, but God exists from his own nature. That is. Everything else has to come to exist, has to be created, has to be. God just is. I am who I am. This is the name of God. His very being, his nature, his, his, his. is. So the, what we can strive for holiness on this earth, we can't ever truly really be holy until we're in heaven. Is that kind of. Okay. <laughs> we can we, we never be holy like God's Right. But we can truly be holy. Okay. Because of and the person, the person. Oh God. Yeah. Okay. Look at it. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah. Okay. Jesus, Jesus come next. Okay. Um, but holiness begins with God's own life. 
right? It's pH width. Again, what kind of super is that? And width. And length, okay? But tie this in then. Keep that in mind. The God is everything we're not is good. But then tie this into goodness. God is pure goodness. God is pure love. Wisdom. Power. God is the one to whom that when we see him, if you see his goodness, his power, his greatness, you recognize who you are. Because God is going to grant us. We see him, we see what we are. Right? And think of the story you hear of this when people see God, or vision of God. What is their response? Fear and they pull out. Right? Whether the saints do this, sinners do this. They go regarding what Christ says, I am He. They all fall out. There, there is this, this tremendous recognition that there's someone here who, who could crush me with that. But at the same time, it's pure goodness and pure love. There is this understanding that that only is the power and greatness. But seeing God, recognizing God, and that is a the same kind of reflection of what I am. What was me? I'm a whole woman. I'm a part of the Lord and single man. I am nothing before. And so there's recognition then of who I am, who God is, and that experience, that, that awe, that, that trembling, that fear, that recognition of who God is, that is experience of goodness. We see this. You know, when Israel approaches the, the, the Mount uh, Sinai, and God appears upon their life, they are afraid to don't let God speak to us. That's who die. When the angel, when the angel appears who are holy, they will come and they'll say, Do not be afraid. Right? When God appears, he says, Don't be afraid. Because I guess I could crush you like a bug, I could destroy you, but I can go to my love. A small, small glimpse of this is I one of my older brothers, a weightlifter and a cop, um, now he has seven kids, who's, who's less into that these days. <laughs> Back in the day, he was benching four hours on the pass. He's a big guy. He's not much taller than me, twice my size. <laughs> you see him holding the baby. <laughs> and the tenderness of, of that is different because he's so Right, the very bigness, the very, the very size makes that more tender. Because he's using that strength to protect, to guard, to love. In a way that someone strong and weak is going to look the same. Right? It's not going to be kind of sweet, it's not going to be the same. God's holiness, God's greatness, God's goodness is like We see it especially when it be in lust. Especially when God speaks to us, we see who God is. So holiness is this all encompassing recognition that God is God. His essence is being his nature. And then from there it's applied to things dedicated to God. In the book of Genesis with creation, you know, there's something that Scott Paul points out in the book. Um, in the middle of the scroll, I saw the little base. It says, Look at Genesis. The word hope is only used one time. You would think it would be all of this. Only just one time. And it's used to describe the Sabbath for us. When God, the seventh day, God blesses the Sabbath and they have to This man on, it's not used again. This man never, never hit a word again in the book of Genesis. It only pops up after Israel is free, the book of Exodus, and God uses that law. Because God is, is now it's other thing is so the, the Sabbath rest, the way you get holy is by belonging to God, belonging to God and being I am and going your life to Him. By walking with Him, by being with Him, by living. Right? Sam dedicated to God before you can see. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. Before he's conceived, or probably before he's conceived, for the Holy Spirit on the way. Um, 
The temple is holy because it's God's home. The priests are holy because they're without service. The vestments are holy because they're dedicated to God. The vessels are holy can use everyone else because they're used to, they're used to, to worship God. Exactly. These are holy because they belong to God. And the more they belong to God, the more they God's alone, the more holy they are. That's why when they're used to it, something that's used to belong to God in the wrong way, it's profane. It's taking something that should belong to God and making ourselves equal to God. So yes, the, the, remember the story of uh, the king um, Balthazar. Um, the Babylonian king, the blank. Kind of then, remember the, the, the hammer in the wall? He goes and he brings the vessels to the temple because that hand right in the wall and, and the, 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 that phrase, right in the wall. Uh, it was it was Nebuchadnezzar's son. It was Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was, 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 was and that was his son, Bart would be my name, I'll remember it after you all. Balthazar was one of the three wise men. Yeah. Balthazar was one of the three wise men, and Daniel has given a name similar to that. Um, but so it's not. It's not that. About that slowly forming in my head. If it comes to you, let me know. Anyway, but because he drinks the vessels that were at the temple, who's the sea? You can weigh your measurement on one. Um, so holy things are those dedicated to God. Belshazzar. Belshazzar. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but close, close enough. That's weird. Belshazzar. They sure did enjoy their switching between consonants and vowels back then. <laughs> and part of it's also, you know, you're transliterating a Babylonian name with the Hebrew then to English. Actually, yeah. the Latin name, probably. Yeah. Maybe a little bit. Maybe a the Old Testament is the first part of the Old Testament. Personal holiness is never described. People, they use holy, people often are holy, people who do certain things are holy because of the office. Uh, but Job loves the Lord as described in the Old Testament. That word is by individual people. Until the book of Dan. There's a description of the Son of Man who comes as the Holy. And then you start seeing saints. The word saint never applied to the Testament. Because when Christ comes, what does he come to do? He comes to give us his life. He comes to give us his spirit. He comes to give us a means to be joined to God and live with God. Where God lives not simply the key, but also the visuals. For God comes from heaven to make us holy. So we hold at the same time the perfect and heavenly Father is perfect. And no one is good without love. He's holy, holy, for I am holy. But by ourselves is an impossible command. For not by ourselves. Because God became man, sanctified the human race, and gave us the grace on the cross. And we see this even in Samson's life. Right? Samson receives the Holy Spirit. And because of this, he has right strength. He defeats no one else he can do. Has the enemies destroy lions, tear apart cities with bare hands. It doesn't come from him, it comes from God. When he's joined to God, he is strong, he is good, he's able to defeat the enemy. Is by himself he does. In the story of uh, Moses on the mountain, I forget, I think it's Deuteronomy, I believe. Um, Moses is, what point of the story? Moses is in a realm to all three people coming after him, and so he asks for the 70 people. Seven brothers are appointed, they're all going to get the Holy Spirit so they can help Moses in the people. And so when they approach God, they get sanctified, except for two who are in camp, they ignite. But the 70 get filled with the Holy Spirit, to the camp also filled with the Spirit, with the work of Moses. And Joshua says, Stop, and 
all this opportunity to prophesy, speak, heed God's voice, hear God's voice, speak God's behalf. Including the two who, who were not doing their job. And Joshua said, stop them from speaking. And Moses says, no, God gave the gift that they speak. But everyone would have the Holy Spirit of God. Um, right, because the occasion isn't about Christ's holiness, it's about God's gift. Now, if you're called, you need to be holy, you don't fail in your job, but the calling isn't because of the holy God, the calling is because of God's goodness. But then what happens is they see, after they get this, they see a vision of God. They're with Moses, to so they feel the Holy Spirit, they see a vision of God. And it says in the scripture, though they saw God, they weren't struggling then, they could still leave and pray. They could still, they were still, they were still alive. When they had to saw God. See that this is a mirroring of that in John chapter 14. This is the last sight. So you have you know this back and forth between the apostles and the Lord. Our Lord says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Because if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. Henceforth you know him and have seen him. But at seeing God, knowing God, walking with God, there's something that the 72 God, Moses saw, Joshua saw, had a vision they saw God. And then they were blessed and able to do God's will. So Philip says to Jesus, Lord, show us the book. Now that you be satisfied. He's thinking Moses. He's thinking, you know, yeah, right, cool. You know, I'm, I'm here for it. Let me see the vision. So you are at least with Moses. Let me see that. We're good. He said to him, I love you so long that you don't know me. He who has seen me has seen the fall. How can you say, show us the fall? Because Jesus is God. They've been walking with God, eating with God, drinking with God, speaking with God, face to face. They have been knowing God and walking with God. Do you not believe that the I am the Father, the Father is in me? The words I say do not speak of my own authority. The Father who dwells in me does his works. Not words, works. I speak truth, the Father does miracles. Believe me that I am the Father, hear my words. The Father is in me. I'll speak for the sake of the works. You've seen the miracles. You've seen what I'm doing. You may not. And then connect us to the Holy Spirit. If you love me, I'll keep my commandments. I will pray to the Father who will give another counsel. You will be friend, even the Spirit of truth. The Lord cannot receive, neither sees him nor knows him. Okay, this is seeing. If you see me, you see him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. So you have here again this effect of holiness. For holiness comes from God. Holiness is God coming to us. Sanctifying us and giving us the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. This happened in the Sabbath. This happened in the Bible, and I was a new Christ after profession. But it comes with this union with God. This union is so real, so strong, that God dwells in us in the temple and makes us whole. He gives us, in fact, His own very life. He said, I will give you my life. When He says, I'm trading my blood for you. Remember, for the Jews, life was the blood. That's why that's my blood belongs to God. And God is the one who has life. And Christ is drinking my blood. He's saying, drink my life. Receive my life. His life is divine life. God is giving us divine life, eternal life. Which eternal is different than everlasting life. Eternal life is God's life. When God comes to us and gives us His grace, the sanctifying grace, the evil of God is so real that man can become whole. Man can share in union with God. Man can walk with God and live with God and be with God. Right, when we're here in heaven. Holiness is this receptive to receiving of God's gifts and living it out. And in Samson, this is manifest by that strength. But we were holy, we were instead of grace, we had that spiritual strength and even conquer not just human being, but even. 
Conquer sin to take conquer ourselves. Conquer the devil to conquer sin. And when we follow God, this is God obey his commandments. Love me. Give the commandments. We will stand firm and walk with God, and live with God, and be a son of God, and be holy. Dedicated to God and sharing God's own holiness. We'll share with God's own, we share, we have part of God's own being. We walk with some of the dogs. And if we sin, we reject God's holiness of grace and liberate with the choices. We have profaned what God has done. And St. Paul goes so far as to say, do not know if you profane the temple of God, you be destroyed. Because God will destroy those who profane his temple. If you sin. And we see this again in Samson's life. When he sins, when he rejects God's man, he first drinks, then he sleeps around, then he betrays God. He's blinded, he's captured, he's defeated, and ten minutes he has to repent. So Samson becomes this reflection of this image of the holiness is meant to be. In his own being, the person he shows us holiness comes from God, not from ourselves. And when he goes from the fall is when we say, I got this. I don't need help with God. When we go on the occasion of sin, when we don't pray, we don't speak to God, and we, and we end up hurting ourselves. We end up our principles around us. Questions on this? Just commenting on um, yes. that passage of uh, from John and yeah. Philip, and just how Jesus, he just gets done black and white telling them, hey, this is how it goes. And then comes right back and like, hey, why don't you do this? Why don't you assist? And it's like, how much patience do you have? <laughs> <laughs> well, you see at times, right? It's how much longer does that need with you? Yes. <laughs> you know? and, and you get the impression, he's not really angry, but definitely <laughs> last word. It's a little, little, little tongue in cheek, it's a little bit, you know, he's, he's saying partially amused. He's also not very nervous. <laughs> You see, I banged his head. <laughs> uh, yes, sir. <laughs> you know, we, or Peter will come to him in, in, in the same the same time frame. So we're going to die for you more. Peter and I have given him a few times before he turns to the cockroach. Peter, pray. Yes, Lord, pray. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, pray. You're going to fall. You got to pray afterwards. <laughs> It's a good thing we're different. Like <laughs> <laughs> Gideon, oh, this, sorry, first, other questions, sorry, or comments. Like Gideon, Samson points to Christ, not in the Sem, <laughs> but in the other plans. And first of all is his strength. Of course, when Christ comes to conquer not an army, but by his own good, his own person. Christ comes, he's the least, he is the strong man of God. The angels, there's only the angels named in the scriptures. Michael, Raphael, and David. And their names point to their missions. Do you ever remember what Gabriel's name means? Strength of God? Strength of God? Or you could say strong man of God? I just know the, uh, the IEL, which was originally EAL, mm -hmm. or I forget how it was originally. You put that in the clues, yeah. Yeah, Good. of God. Yeah. Right, and so Gabriel is the one who always speaks about the incarnation, he's always the one talking about the incarnation. And so Gabriel's name is strength of God, a strong man of God, and he's the one who announces the strong one of God, who defeats the devil and death and hell. Defeats sin. And he does so with God's strength, he does so with the holiness and the virtue, and imparts it to us as well. We can become strong in him, and wise in him, and powerful. And Michael. She said Michael. But Raphael is God's healing, Michael is who is like God. 
Mike Sampson, although it's constantly from his birth, now it's by angel and Paul is in the end of the in Albert. Unlike Samson, the Lord sticks with that consecration and lives that vacation to God. Mike Samson, he ends his life in mockery story. He ends his life um, being made fun of, being, being attacked by enemies, being defeated by enemies. But he conquers by his death. Samson, like Christ, like Samson, conquered by his death. On the cross, Christ defeats Satan. Christ defeats it. Christ defeats it. So it's the conquering and by his death, if he destroys and wins, he does so dedicated to God. He does so aside, and he does so giving his own life to the Lord for our, our behalf. And so the Samson, the judge, points to the judge Christ. His strength, his dedication to God, and his dying to redeem of the sin. Questions, comments? I have a question. Yes. If we always show Michael as defeating Satan, you see Gabriel is the strength of God and defeated Satan. Well, what is incarnation. But sure. But um, what about Raphael? So God heals. Mm -hmm. or, or. Right. And, and so and so who does he heal from? Oh, okay. Right? Remember the story the story of Sarah and Tobit? Uh -huh. Right, it's the demon of Odius. Who he so he's healing physically, he also goes and defeats the, the demon. Okay. Because he's as God's holiness. He's sharing that life with God. Good. Were the judges um, called judges by Israel? So yes. Acknowledged as yes. such? Yes. Um, it's unclear if they would have been given all given the title at the time, but certainly not too long after they were recognized as judges. Um, you know, that is the title given to them in the scripture. Uh, and, and it's described, it, it says they judge this world during their lifetime. Uh, so, whether we're given that, that title <coughs> at the moment or alive, probably depended on, on, on the man. Uh, but afterwards, when this was being written down, that, that was how they described it as the judges. How big of an area would one judge like be over? Like, Technically, over all of Israel, but their influence uh, would depend upon the map. So, someone like Gideon, a little bit longer, and after the feast of the enemy, um, could have more influence. Someone like Samson, who's kind of running around in the wilderness, being a wild man, you know, it, it's, it's inspiring, certainly, drawing off the attack of the enemy, and, and the end does double their power so they're taken care of. Um, but Personal influence a little less. Because he, he never had any kind of power over in the same way. Except so, just, as it were. Yeah. So, yeah, so, so some, some of them were basically very high, high place. Some of them were parts of it. Um, but the fact that they had judge now this is a response to that order, a response to sin, to bring Israel back. And so they are seen as leaders of Israel, of the entire people nation, even though human being people, you know, they're yeah. Areas aren't going to fall in there, ignore it, they're going to yeah. take a little longer to catch up. <laughs> okay, anything else? Just a little addition. Uh, yes. You're talking about Samson and using the jawbone of a donkey. Mm -hmm. I actually found out um, about a year ago that the jawbone of all equine species is one of the oldest tools humanity has made. I don't think it, so it was used as a weapon actually by a long time. but. I don't think it loses much meaning because it's essentially the same at the time as um, you know a man with a, a musket taking on an entire fully equipped army. Yeah. <laughs> it, but it fits with his wild man thing because it, it would have probably been considered a very like you know feral feral man weapon. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Help us to consecrate our hearts and our lives to you who received your life. They walk with you be you here on earth and live with you forever in heaven. Be all that we say and we for your glory. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, it is now and ever shall be. World without end. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.